Hello to all physics and physical experiment enthusiasts. This is Andrei Shchetnikov, and our video today will be dedicated to how sound is produced in a simple musical instrument like a flute, with holes. And this question is essentially divided into two fundamentally different parts. First, what actually makes the flute sound? And second, how does this sound appear when I blow into the hole? And we will divide these two questions into two parts, discussing them one by one in detail. And one of the simplest flutes is indeed the very Andean cana, a through tube incorporating six holes on the top and one small octave valve at the bottom, the wedge that we blow into. And now I will gently blow into it, making sure to close all the holes completely. And we will carefully look at the unique characteristics and properties of this particular sound on the audio track, we see a periodic signal, which corresponds to a frequency of 390 hertz on the spectrogram. This is the G note of the first octave. This signal is by no means similar to a simple sine wave. It has a rather complex shape, and in the spectrum of this shape, there are higher harmonics or overtones at frequencies of 780 hertz, 1170 hertz, 1560 hertz, and so on. They are all multiples of the fundamental frequency of 390 hertz, 1050 hertz, and so on. They are all multiples of the fundamental frequency of 390 hertz. And to explain what determines the frequency of the fundamental tone at 390 hertz, we will consider a simple model of longitudinal natural vibrations of air in cylindrical tubes. If the tube is open at both ends, the air oscillates by entering and exiting the tube at these ends, and the pressure at the ends of the tube is close to atmospheric pressure. In the fundamental oscillation mode, air either fills the tube and the pressure in the center increases or partially exits the tube and the pressure in the center decreases. In this case, the length of the tube accommodates half the length of the sound wave. In the next mode, air enters the tube at one end and exits at the other, and vice versa. At the same time, in the middle of the tube, the air also moves towards both end movements. And when the pressure increases in one half of the tube due to compression, it decreases in the other half due to rarefaction, and after half a period, these areas switch places. In the center of the tube, there is a pressure node where it is always equal to atmospheric pressure, and the length of the tube accommodates one wavelength of the sound wave. The next mode is arranged so that there are two pressure nodes and three antinodes inside the tube, and the length of the tube accommodates one and a half wavelengths of the sound wave, and so on. Now we need to apply this theoretical model to a real Andean Kina flute. The frequency of the fundamental tone was 390 hertz. 190 hertz. The length of this flute is 37.5 centimeters. Now let's calculate the wavelength. Divide 343 m per s by 390 hertz for 87 centimeters wavelength. Half wavelength is 43.5 centimeters, 6 centimeters more than 37.5. Half the wavelength is 43.5 centimeters, which is 6 centimeters more than 37.5. What is the matter here? One weak, the other stronger. Reasons. One weak and the other stronger. The weak one is that the air here at the open concert is not effective. The tube still moves slightly, which lengthens the effective length a bit, but it doesn't lengthen it significantly, of course, not by six centimeters. And the second, more important reason is that when I bring the flute to my lips and press it against my chin, this hole here, it's very small. And I don't think that the pressure amplitude right here at the chin is zero, meaning that the pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. And this indeed leads to an even more significant, very effective elongation of the flute. So here we are indeed, actually explaining why the actual length of the flute is less than half the wavelength. As for the overtones at multiple frequencies, we also understand their nature. These overtones correspond to the second, third, fourth, and subsequent modes of the natural oscillations of air in the tube with wavelengths of two, three, four, and so on. More than the wavelength of the fundamental mode. By opening the flute's holes one by one from the bottom, I shorten the length of the air column and accordingly increase the frequency of the fundamental tone along with all its overtones. And this is understandable. But much still remains unclear to us. For example, why did the soundtrack for the low G note have such a peculiar and unique shape? 
Why wasn't it a pure sine wave? And even more importantly, why does my continuous blowing on the flute's wedge cause rapid oscillations of the air column inside the flute? This phenomenon occurs because the steady stream of air I blow into the flute interacts with the wedge, creating vibrations. These vibrations then travel through the air column inside the flute, causing it to oscillate rapidly. How one thing is connected to another, how one is hooked onto the other. And this is what we are going to figure out now. And in some old books, you can read that the source of the flute sounds is the so-called edge tone, knife tone, or wedge tone. I take the knife blade, bring it to my lips, and start blowing on it gently. And in a certain position, a characteristic hissing sound can be heard. It is actually indeed behind the blade that the so-called Carmen Vortex Street forms. By the way, we mentioned it in the recent video, Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse. And if you haven't watched that video yet, I highly recommend you do. And then there are these hissing vortices. They produce the corresponding sound, and it is said that this sound is amplified with the help of a resonator. The resonator selects a specific frequency from it and hums at that frequency, sending the sound further into the space. However, this explanation still seems suspicious. Here I take a block flute in my hands. There is also a wedge here, which is blown on through a slit and I start blowing very gently, slowly and carefully, and softly, to create a gentle breeze. And at the same time, although I blow as if I'm breathing lightly on glass, a steady sound is produced. Could this sound possibly be caused by some kind of hissing at the wedge, or perhaps something else? Actually, the explanation is different, and we are going to figure it out now. When I tap my finger on one of the flute's holes, like this, A sound is also heard. Although it is not loud and quickly fades away, it is essentially the same tone as now, to be continued. And when I blow, the energy of the airstream somehow transfers into the energy of the air column's oscillations. We need a mechanism to explain this transfer. We have it. It's called self-oscillation as a phenomenon in physics and engineering. Let's consider a system capable of oscillation. To prevent these oscillations from damping, energy must be supplied to the system from an external source, and it must be done in the correct phase. A self-oscillation system is one that regulates the energy intake from a source by means of feedback, which opens and closes the energy supply valve. What is the oscillator here? We know it is indeed actually the air column. What is the source of energy? We know that, too. Now, we need to understand how the feedback works here. It works quite simply. I start blowing into the mouthpiece slit, slightly pushing the air column, and it begins to oscillate. Then the following happens. When the air column contracts and air enters it, this flow pulls inward under the wedge and the stream from the mouthpiece, and it pushes the air column with its flow, transferring its energy to it. And when the air column expands and the air exits outward, the jet rises above the wedge and does not take energy from the column. As a result, periodic impulses are produced, supplying energy to the oscillations in the air column in the correct phase. And now it's time for our traditional concluding question. And of course, we still have the question about timbre, but it is too complex for us, so I will ask you a simpler question. I take a transverse flute in my hands and close all its holes. And in this finger position, I can produce not just one, but at least three different sounds from it, like this. The question is, in essence, how exactly is this phenomenon to explained? Please write your thoughts on this matter in the comments to this video on YouTube and share.